But why do friends betray one another? To answer this question, we have to first understand why a former enemy could do us great favor or even become our savior. To explain how this works, I'd like to tell you a story. During the American Civil War, which took place between 12th April 1861 and 9th April 1865, Union Major General Ulysses S. Grant developed a hatred for Jews under his territory because some Jews were allegedly violating every regulation of trade established by the Treasury Department. To solve this problem, on December 17, 1862, Major General Ulysses S. Grant decided to expel all Jews from his territory. We're fighting for our right to live, to exist. We're going to survive. Today, we celebrate our Independence Day. The Jews were expected to leave their businesses, houses, and everything they had and get lost forever. However, Jewish community leaders protested. There was an outcry by members of Congress and the press, which made President Abraham Lincoln countermand the general's order on January 4, 1863. Buzzards, God's man. I am the President of the United States of America, clothed in immense power. Now, this is where I'm going with this story. By 1868, General Ulysses S. Grant started campaigning to be the U.S. president. As a campaign promise, he claimed that he didn't hate Jews. And when he won the election and became the president on March 4, 1869, he needed to prove that he truly didn't hate the Jews. One of Grant's first acts as president was the appointment of Simon Wolf, a leading Jewish attorney, to the position of recorder of deeds. Soon, Wolf became the president's primary advisor. To prove further that he didn't hate Jews, Grant appointed more Jews into his cabinet than any U.S. president before him. But he still has more to prove. When Grant got to know about the persecution against Jews in Europe, he jumped into action, spoke out forcefully against an order expelling 2,000 Jews from border areas of Russia. And following the persecution of Jews in Romania in 1870, Grant appointed a Jewish lawyer, Benjamin F. Pezzotto, as America's consul to that country. But he still had more to prove. On Friday, June 9, 1876, Ulysses Grant became the first American president ever to attend the dedication of a synagogue where he appeared at Washington's Adar's Israel Synagogue. I mean, up until 1876, 14 years after he had shown himself as a public enemy of Jews, S. Grant still felt compelled to show favor to the Jewish community. They need a decision, Mr. President. These past few hours have been the longest, darkest of my life. The reason for this is very simple. Your former enemy has a lot to prove. He wants you to stop seeing him as an enemy. He wants to go the extra mile to show you his love, sacrifices, and affections. Unfortunately, the opposite might sometimes be the case with a longtime friend. A longtime friend has shown you several times that he loved you. He had shown you a lot of affections, and if an opportunity comes to betray you, he might do it faster than your enemy. And that leads us to the first reason why your friend may find it easy to betray you. The first time I learned about the concept of moral licensing was through Malcolm Gladwell in his June 2016 podcast titled The Lady Vanishes. Moral licensing is a psychological bias in which doing good for some time often encourages us to do bad. For example, let's say this is Matthew and this is Jude. Everyone in Matthew and Jude's circle of friends knows how much Matthew loves Jude. Several times in the past, Matthew had stood up and fought in defense of Jude. However, one day Jude did something to offend Matthew, and since Matthew knows Jude's employer personally, he started thinking of how to make Jude lose his job. In this case, Matthew can easily hurt Jude and still feel good about it. After all, when their friends hear about it, they will all say, Oh, Matthew used to love Jude. For him to have hurt him that much, it must have been because Jude did something evil. Moral licensing can work the other way round, and here's an example. So let's say tomorrow Chris Rock gets broke and needs a loan of $1 million. Who in the world do you think is the best person for him to call? Well, this guy. And the reason is very simple. Uh-oh. 
Richard. <laughs> oh, wow. Having done something awful to Chris in the public by slapping him in the face, the law of moral licensing suggests that Will Smith would be compelled to do a great favor for Chris Rock if he had the opportunity in the future. In the Malcolm Gladwell podcast I mentioned earlier, he cited the example of Elizabeth Thompson and her 1874 roll call and that of the Prime Minister of Australia, Julia Gillard, and how men are likely to close doors of opportunity to women after opening it just once. So here's the conclusion of this subheading. Because of the moral license and bias, it may be easy for any of your friends to betray you since they have shown in the past how good they were to you. In March of 1957, most likely 6th of March, Martin Luther King Jr. and Richard Nixon met in Ghana for the first time, as they were both invited for the Ghana Independence Celebration. From there, both Nixon and Luther became good friends, exchanging letters, talking and visiting. In one of his letters, Martin Luther wrote, I will long remember the rich fellowship which we shared and the fruitful discussions that we had. But then in 1960, Dr. King was arrested. And while his wife was afraid that they might kill him on the way to prison, she called two people, Richard Nixon, who was King's friend, and John F. Kennedy, who has never been King's friend till that time. Guess what? Nixon turned Martin Luther King down because he was afraid of the white voters. It was in fact John F. Kennedy who stood up for Dr. King and helped him out of prison. This is the point of the story. While a friend might turn against you as a result of social licensing, they might also do the same when there is a conflict of interest. In the above story, Richard Nixon was contesting an election to become the U.S. president and he was afraid that helping a black activist at this time could make white voters hate him. Now, you might think that losing an election is a big deal and betraying a friend for such might be sometimes worthwhile. But conflict of interest doesn't have to be anything significant. In fact, what another person considers a conflict of interest might be as ridiculous as his need of sleep while you need him to drive you to the hospital or her need to brag in public about something you told her was a secret. Let me give you an example. On January 24th, 1848, James W. Marshall found shiny metal in a tail race of a lumber mill he was building for Sacramento pioneer John Sutter near Coloma on the American River. Marshall brought what he found to Sutter and the two privately tested the metal. After the test showed that it was gold, Sutter expressed dismay, wanting to keep the news quiet because he feared what would happen to his plans for an agricultural empire if there was a gold rush in the region. Having sworn all concerned at the mill to secrecy, in February 1848, Sutter sent Charles Bennett to Monterey to meet with Connell Manson, the chief U.S. official in California, to secure the mineral rights of the land where the mill stood. Bennett was not to tell anyone of the discovery of gold, but when he stopped at Benicia, he heard talk about the discovery of coal near Mount Diablo, and he blotted out the discovery of gold. He continued to San Francisco, where again he could not keep the secret. His only gain was the bragging, the idea that he is more informed than others. By March 1848, rumors of the discovery were confirmed by San Francisco newspaper publisher and merchant Samuel Brannan. On August 19, 1848, the New York Herald newspaper reported the discovery of gold in California. On December 5, 1848, U.S. President James K. Polk confirmed the discovery of gold in an address to Congress. What John Sutter feared most had happened. There was a gold rush, and his plans for agricultural empire was ruined. In conclusion, to have a meaningful life, you need friends. Our friends inspire us. They challenge us to do what we otherwise wouldn't try and help us out when we are in crisis. Many of your friends will never betray you, but if you live long enough, one of them would, and it might be for the reasons stated in this video.